Hit record. We're not supposed to be funny. This is educational. But we still have to warm up. Okay, well, warm my ass. Um, dude, there are people listening. Don't be disgusting. <laughs> um, this is how you do it. You'd be like, and then don't go, don't go. <laughs> You sound like pervy, pervy <laughs> Mr. Miyagi. Yeah. Oh, my God. Gives a whole it's new like, meaning to wax on. Wax, wax on? Off. Wax off. <laughs> wax off. Ugh. <laughs> 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 okay, that was wrong. Pervy Mr. Miyagi. I don't know. I wanted to turn it into a lame insult. Can't take you anywhere. Warm Literally, my ass. You know how you say my, my ass. Say, say it like uh, Christopher Walken. Warm up my ass. <laughs> that was the worst Christopher Walken. Warm you... up my ass. <laughs> <laughs> That's a better one. That's that was the first one was the worst Christopher Walken you've ever done before. I don't even know which one this is. Fifty-nine. No, 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 shocking. How shocking? Fifty-nine. It's fifty-eight. No. No. I just did fifty-eight. You don't know what you're talking about. Uh, I'm pretty sure I know what I'm talking about. I'm pretty sure you don't. I'm going to find proof. Okay, right. I'll, I'll be here waiting for that proof. Totally. And see, 58 was... Oh, that's 56. Okay, I'm blind. <laughs> this is 58. You're not blind. You're ignorant. I would just, just, just take my word for it. Like, between the two of us, who never knows what number it is? Even when I do know the number, <laughs> you it's don't know the, the wrong number because we're recording out of order. <laughs> okay, everybody, quiet on the set. Film Revery Podcast, take 58. And action. Oh, God. Hello, Film Revery listeners. This is Michael Beckemeyer. And as always, un- this is Bradley Blee Balding Ewan. <laughs> Bradley Blee Balding. <laughs> you, you said Michael Beckemeyer like yeah, it was. I was supposed to say, well, my name has a majestic ring to it. Oh. Hello, Film Reverie listeners. This is Michael Beckemeyer. Beckemeyer. And as always, and unfortunately, I'm joined by the Balding Ewan. <laughs> I don't know what that was for. It sounds like. He dazes. <laughs> he dazes. He dazzles. It's the Balding Ewok! <laughs> These people are supposed to be learning from us. Um, in the fr- right. in the first two minutes of our show, we've had the ass thing. Oh. And ridiculous name. Yeah. I don't yeah. know, man. Coffee. <laughs> I got my medicine today. So, <laughs> so um, what we what we want to do with this next this next yeah. batch of this next new batch of episodes that we're doing? Yeah, basically is, the episodes where it's just Mike and Brad, or aka Balding Ewok. Uh, we decided that we're gonna share. Uh, we're just gonna share what we know and what we've learned. Um, all the skills we learned uh, for screenwriting. Um, and we've officially made a feature film. It's done. Um, and it's, we think it's decent for, you know, not having any money yeah. and just pulling it together by the hair, skin of our teeth. Yeah. Or the hair of our asses. My, my main <laughs> lesson that I've learned through this whole process is maybe don't make a movie with Brad. That is not the lesson you learned. <laughs> I'd be much happier. <laughs> you wouldn't have a feature film. If oh, it wasn't for balding either. I would have one. It might sound worse <laughs> and not be mixed very well. And not look so crazy. <laughs> it wouldn't sound at all. Yeah. So I can accomplish <laughs> recording sounds. <laughs> like. <laughs> so um, we basically, so we decided to go back to, not back, but to start basically at the beginning um, with what, you know, Brad's the one that has really harped on this a lot between the two of us. Is the um, the mythic structure of things the way like every uh, you won't you won't don't want to say every classic story but you 
in almost every classic movie or story in the world, yeah, it hits certain few points that are like so almost like uh, mythological sweet spots. Yeah, ba- um, basically, this guy Joseph Campbell uh, did researched all the stories, uh, mythology. Um, and he found the, the common thread between all the stories yeah. um, and uh, realized that even uh, the movies, the TV shows, the books, every story that we've been telling since we started telling stories has the same format and structure. Would you say since hieroglyphics? I don't, I guess. I guess those are stories. I'm not sure they, the grunt stories. Like you grunt stories, <sighs> Brad. How's it going today? <laughs> In the morning when you call me, it's like, <laughs> yeah, yes, it's true. Um, that's not just that's not located just in the morning sometimes i've called you at four o'clock in the afternoon and you can't get a word out <laughs> yes <laughs> uh, uh, uh. all right we're done making fun of brad no we're not and we're, we're after 20- 25 years i am just getting started <laughs> we this is gonna be three episodes long because we won't be able to get to what we're trying no, to get brad. to we are 58 episodes long. <laughs> <You're still not laughs> and I'm done. still not done. It's still, I still haven't gotten it out of my system. Okay. So Joseph Campbell, <laughs> mythic structure. He's got like 17 points, but we we thought that 17 is too much. And we just want to give not, you guys an introduction. Yeah, well, it's not too much to refer to. It's, right. It's, we wanted to hit the major points of that. And if you wanted to look further into it. Yes. There are stuff. There's stuff all over the internet. I'm gonna have pictures and links yeah. to uh, all this stuff, and even some YouTube videos that go in depth on the different ones. There's basically three di- three main ones that I like. Um, there's the original Joseph Campbell, uh, and then uh, Christopher Vogler wrote the Writer's Journey, based off of uh, Joseph Campbell's mythic structure, and he narrowed it down to 12 points in a story structure. And uh, most recently, uh, what is it, Dan Hammond? Let me get this Dan guy. Harmon. Dan Harmon. Yeah. Yes, he's done, I think he wrote uh, episodes of Community. Well, he, it was his show. Community was his show. And, he's uh, got a new cartoon out. My like favorite that. show, Rick and Morty. Oh, yes. that's him? That's him? Yes. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, now, yes, he's silly, but he is a really smart nerd guy yeah okay so he's really good at figuring stuff out he's sort of a scientist how original a smart nerd he's an amateur scientist oh um he might have some phds i don't know i've seen him on science shows like national geographic but he he narrowed it down to even eight so that's what we're going to use today is dan Dan Harmon's uh eight points eight point story circle yeah. Um, and we're, we decided that we would show you how easy it is to make a story using this um, by telling you by uh, telling the story of our filmmaking journey. Yeah. Um, so there's so, eight points. So he took the seventeen points and basically he simplified it for simplified like it. I, basically for Ease uh, of TV shows. Yeah. Okay. For like you know short form, fifteen minute, whatever. Yeah. You don't have time to do all those things. Yeah. Now, over a series, here's what I think is fascinating. You can take the Joseph Campbell's 17, um, and over a season, mm-hmm. you could apply, you could write a story arc over a season yeah. using that. Well, the, the seasons these days, since they are telling a season is a story, right? it's basically a 10-hour movie. Exactly. Right. So that's kind of how I think of it. So you, each episode can have a story circle. Uh-huh. Uh, hitting the eight points, right. but you can use the overarching. So even in the Star Wars movies, even though each one of the movies is its own hero's journey, the trilogy, the first trilogy that we saw, yeah. Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi, those yeah. have their own. The, so there's stories inside of stories. Inside of stories. The hero's yeah. journey is over the, the trilogy and within each three, yeah. each of the three movies. Uh, but but um, what's his name? George Lucas, uh-huh. um, he used the mythic structure to yeah. write to, to, the Star to like Wars a, movies to a T. To, to a, a T. Yeah. E- each point he has on there, and as we go through the eight, um, I'll mention uh, uh, which part of the Joseph Campbell's uh, 
hero's journey that we're hitting when we're talking about it, just right. so that you can yeah. uh, know where we are on that. Okay, so let's get started. What's the first? What's so the are we going to do the? We're going to go. We're going to go through all the points real quickly and show you how, and explain how they fit into certain popular movies okay. like Star. Well, I guess we're going to use Star Wars and maybe even The Dark Knight. Uh, yeah, if right. you want, uh, you have your choice. So we can do both real quick yeah. because they're just like mentioning things, and then we'll uh, come back and 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 uh, zoom into each of the points a little bit based on our filmmaking our own experience. Yeah, saying okay, well here's our yeah. here's yeah. how you apply this to if you just want yeah. Yeah, off yeah. the top of our heads. Although it's not off the top of our heads, but yeah. okay. So the first beat is what? Okay, Don Hammond. Dan labels Harmon, this not Dan Hammond. Dan Dan, 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 not Dan, Dan Dan you said Don Hammond. Dan Sandwich. Don Hammond sounds like somebody from Mad Men. It's a Don Hammond down there in, in advertising. Don, <laughs> it's Dan Harmon. Dan Harmon. <laughs> yeah. I am so bad with names. Do you know my name? You might want to just stop listening now because why do I want to learn anything from a guy who can't remember names correctly? <laughs> yeah, I'm supposed to take this guy's word for it. <laughs> I'm okay. So Don Hammond. <laughs> Harmon, Dan, Dan Harmon. Harmon, Dan Harmon, you brought this to me. Like you, one. you're the one that found this for me. Number Why one. do I know more about this than you do? <laughs> the start, number one, the beginning, where you start at um, in Joseph Campbell's uh, Matrix. He yeah. thought this is the ordinary world. Ordinary world, like now, fade in. The first thing you see, yeah. how things are before the story gets started. Typical day. Yeah. What is this typical person's typical life, mm-hmm. or you know what's going on? Uh, he, Dan Harmon uh, mm-hmm. calls this you. Mm-hmm. Um, this is the undisturbed status quo of the protagonist that leads you to what he calls the point of attack. So in Star Wars, it's Luke Skywalker yeah, on I the guess. farm with his aunt and uncle. Yeah, so okay. And in uh, we have a note here for The Dark Knight, which is when Bruce... Uh, in The Dark Knight, and that's the one with... Um, Dark Knight is the one with the Joker in the it. The Joker. Right? Yeah, yeah. So, The Dark Knight is the second of the trilogy. Yes. And it's Bruce Wayne dresses up in a special suit and calls himself Batman and brings the pain <laughs> to Gotham's bad guys. Yeah. So, if you think about it, so since it's the second of a Batman trilogy, he's already Batman, but the ordinary yeah. world is he's just doing the Batman thing. I think there's also, a, to set up the storyline for later when, he, uh, when we get to the end... He's also considering uh, falling in love and giving up the uh-huh. Batman. Yeah. So there's a, they tease that early on in the movie that you know he's yeah. think he's starting to fall in love and you know uh, so that's where we start with, in the ordinary world with Batman. Okay. So the second point. It's By like, the way, we should mention that this little thing that we we're, we're doing now is going to be available as a download on our website. Yes. Right. All you have to do is sign up for our mailing list, and you'll be able to get this as a free yeah. download. And then over the course of this series or season or whatever of Film Reverie, you'll be able to... We'll have multiple things that we give you for downloads. Yes. Yeah. And you, eventually, you'll have a whole bunch of stuff. You yeah, can it's like get. you can call it the Film Reverie textbook. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, um, <laughs> I don't know. We just want to share. We want to help. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, other people. These are all things that we're thinking about when we're writing, uh, when we were writing our movie. And again, we want to make sure that we clarify that even though we made a movie for zero dollars, which it's not us saying we think our movie is great and here's why we're so brilliant. This is just stuff that we're thinking about when we're writing our movie. You may or may not like our movie. That's fine. We want you to like our movie. But ultimately, um, ultimately, it basically is saying, here's what we did to get a movie made. And we know a lot of people out there listening are also trying to get a movie made. And here's how we did it. Here's and, our process. And the, I think the biggest triumph and our main goal was to have really good characters and to tell a good story. Yeah. Um, so regardless of whether you like it or not, they're really good characters. Yeah. Says the person who wrote no, it. No, we've got, that's, we get compliments. We do. Yeah, we do get compliments. Yeah. But, you know, that's a matter of opinion. It is a matter man, of opinion. As the but, dude would say. As, That's just yes. your opinion, man. That is true. Um, <laughs> okay, so the need. Number, the, the second point here in the little story circle. Yes. This would be the call to adventure. Yeah. And so that's the, the moment story. when that's Luke when, gets the hologram yes, from R2-D2. That would be the call to adventure. Yeah. Um, so Dan Harmon calls this the need. Number yeah. two, the need. 
Yeah. This is the creation of the story. This leads to defining the main tension. Yeah. So that's when we discover, okay, this person uh, needs something, and uh, they have to make a decision yeah. whether or not, to, you know, do I leave? Do I stick with the ordinary world? Yeah. Yeah. Because it's basically, uh, you know, you got to go to on this adventure to get this thing. And it could be an internal, could be something he needs to learn personally, or it could be an external thing, like someone was kidnapped and you need to go get the back. <laughs> yeah. It's the thing that happens that pulls you, that points out the fact that they're, oh, maybe I'm not really living in an ordinary world. Yeah. It's, do in I the, take the blue pill or the red pill? In the Matrix, pill? that's when uh, Neo gets the uh, Morpheus, starts yeah. talking to him on the screen. Yeah. You know, um, so that's his call to adventure. Yeah. Number okay. three yeah. is uh, Don... Dan Harmon calls this the go, which I guess is when you cross the threshold. Yeah. Um, that's what uh, Joseph Campbell calls it, crossing right. the threshold. So well, that's what I was just talking about a second ago. In The Matrix, it's take the blue pill or the red pill. Right. If you take the, what is it, the red pill, you go back to normal, the blue pill, or is it the other way around? I always forget which pill he takes. Uh, he takes the red pill. Okay, so it's the if you take the blue pill, you go back, back to the to ordinary normal. world, yeah. and you can be in denial. You're not even, not even going to remember this. Or you can take the red pill and, as you say, go or cross the threshold into the adventure that is awaiting for you on the other side. Yeah, and I want to give two, just throw in two points real quick. Here around this uh, area, um, it's before you cross the threshold in Joseph Campbell's Matrix, um, you have the refusal of the call, which is in Star Wars. Like Luke tells Obi-Wan that he can't go to Alderaan because... Mm. Of family responsibilities, but it also could be, you know, I don't want to change, I don't want to do this, that's scary, leave my job, whatever. Yeah, you sound crazy. Right. You sound crazy, yeah. Uh, and then also there's the introduction to the mentor figure or supernatural aid. So that would be, you know, Obi-Wan coming in in Star Wars uh, to instruct Luke in the ways of the Force. Yeah. Um, but in Dan Harmon's eight, abbreviated, abbreviated he just version. skips right to crossing the threshold um yeah so that would be in star wars luke follows obi-wan into the cantina in Mos Eisley. i think i said that correctly and uh in search of a pilot which would be your favorite han solo han solo yeah yeah um point number four yeah and Again, we realize that this might be difficult to follow through while we're just doing it's a lot of words we're throwing yeah. at you. But at, currently, right now, if you want to, you can go to our website, sign up for the mailing list, and get this as a download and then follow along as we're talking. Yeah, you could pause, yeah. get the uh, document, and follow along. And uh, you can even fill in the little points that maybe your story wants to hit on, yeah. your, on your way around as we're talking. Yeah, I'm going to leave blank spots on yeah. there so they okay, can do cool. it. It's an editable document. Yeah. So um, next, we did go already, so hit, right. hit four. Search. Is this the search for Spock? <laughs> um, <N> no. <laughs> um, but that would be the search in the search for Spock. <laughs> yes. All right, so search is the first attempt to resolve the main tension. The road of trials uh, leads to a midpoint uh, find this and refine the main tension, narrows its scope, and makes it more specific. So, in Star Wars, what what yeah. moment is that? Let me click the button. I think that would be the test Ally, yeah. allies and enemies in the mythic structure. Um, so, Star Wars, Luke meets Han Solo and Chewbacca in Mos Eisley. They meet up. C-3PO, R2-D2, blah, blah, blah. And um, he learns from Obi-Wan Kenobi that Darth Vader murdered his father and begins training with the lightsaber. So what are they, what are they like in the search of there? Trials, this is where you start the trials and tribulations of your story begin. Mm -hmm. After you cross the dirt, you begin. Yeah. You, um, oh, now that I've gotten you on this ship, I'm going to start teaching you about this thing called yeah. the Force. It sounds like a bunch of mumbo-jumbo. Mm -hmm. I'm going to blindfold you and let you get zapped by the electronic floating right. robot. Okay. Also, things need to go wrong. Your story will be boring and not interesting if things don't go wrong. Mm. So this would be where you start having things go wrong. Kind of like a one step forward, two steps back. Yeah. So you need to see progress, but you also need to mm -hmm. take your hero down a bit. Yeah. In Star Wars, he's already pretty down because he, he doesn't even know what he doesn't know at that point. Yeah. 
He's just basically a goofy kid. He's still like an adolescent at this point. Mm -hmm. What is it, number five? Yeah. This will take you to, uh, Dan Harmon calls this the find. So you begin with the search. This is in the middle portion Mm -hmm. um, of your movie, the search and find. Um, This is when your protagonist finds what they think they need, but it doesn't work out quite the way they expect it. So your protagonist must pay a devastating price for attaining what they sought. Uh, so in Batman, or I mean The Dark Knight, it's when Bruce finds how to stop the Joker and save Gotham by unmasking himself, but Harvey Dent does it first. Hmm. Hmm, interesting. Harvey Dent, uh, I don't remember. Two-Face, Two-Face. Right, so he unmasks. That he unmasks. Does Harvey Dent unmask himself? I think he unmasks I think he, himself. I think he reveals himself as. Yeah. As Two Face. Because yeah. he became the target. Right. After he did that. Right. So where's this? Where's Are, this falling? How's this falling to Star Wars? You got the notes over there for Star Wars. But, uh, it's this seems like the part where you would be. Uh, what do I say? Luke enters the Death Star as the Millennium Falcon is captured by a tractor beam, and uh, what happens here will change him forever. So, yeah, basically when you find the thing that you think you need, it it changes you. So what does Luke find that he thinks he needs that changes him? No, that is, is that when they actually rescue the princess? I believe when they get That's when yeah. they get her out of the thing. It's in the belly of the well because yeah. he gets arrested and then they learn the princess They're actually, there. actually, in a way, they are in the belly of that that thing. They're down that's, in the garbage dump. Right. Yeah. 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 So I, I would say that's that whole sequence. And then... Yeah. Um, they save Princess Leia, and they all escape. So, number six. The number six beat is Take, which is a full frontal assault on main main tension. This leads to the main tension being resolved, yes or no, for now. So, I would say this is where the action, you know, if your story's going like a roller coaster ride, where you're going up, 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 this would be where it climaxes and, you know, starts getting real exciting. You go down the... Uh, you know when you that first drop on the roller coaster where it's like really mm-hmm. scary and then you come up and then you go all around this that would be that part in the story. Let me see what would that be in Batman? He finally takes the Joker in and has him in his clutches, but the Joker springs a trap and it costs Rachel her life and Bruce his future. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that changes Batman for forever. That's right. a death in a so... Technically, in Star Wars, uh, in Star Wars: A New Hope, a uh, couple of things happen that changes his future. The actually the death of Mentor, which is its own beat, but the Mentor uh, Obi Wan actually dies, and that changes his future. But at the yeah. same time, um, he is this when they go off on and they he blows up the uh, the uh, Death Star. Yeah. So he actually says yes or no to that. He goes off and does it. And what changes his... Shoots him off in a, in a whole different direction is he's also a great pilot, suddenly, somehow. It's like a leap of faith. <laughs> yeah. Because he goes on this... It's a de- not a death mission, a suicide mission. So the rebirth would be the mentor coming back into his thoughts. Obi-Wan comes back into his force. thoughts. Use the force, Luke. And he, like, shoots his bullets and it works. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which seems so easy. Like, yeah. how come that doesn't work for me? <laughs> yeah. It, too bad it doesn't work in life the way yeah. it does in movies. Um, yeah, so uh, next, number seven, is The Return. Which is a false resolution or exposition sequence. This leads to the twist. We've been set up to expect one thing, then it turns around. The, the achievement of the goal. So the, the false the false resolution would be the false resolution is actually when they rescue the princess because it seems like that's what they've been working on the whole time is getting Princess Leia. Oh, but don't they also figure out um, at the same time that the there's a Death Star and uh, right? Uh, oh, when they rescue her, they find out that that's what destroyed her planet. Yeah. Um, was this big Death Star, and then yeah. they have to do something about it. Right. So, but they rescue her, so that's the false resolution. Mm-hmm. They get her. They, they they solve the mission, basically, they've been working on for the first hour and a half here. Yeah. And then they are thrown off into into another thing altogether. Yeah, which is leads us into the third act. Yeah. Where you're basically 
wrapping things up, getting to the conclusion. Yeah. Um, um, in in Dark Knight, it is the protagonist returns but changed. For Bruce, the need to retire Batman was lost with Rachel. We now he must protect Gotham. The Joker has turned Harvey, making Batman's final task that much more painful. Right. So that that's this is where you see the change. This is also, I think, in the twelve act version of Christian Christopher Bogler's. Um, this would be called the change. I've seen this in other story circles. Um, where this is where they they're changed, um, and this is also where they come out of the special world. Um, and I'll show you uh, a picture um, if you can download it or go to our website. I'll have the pictures on the post. Mm-hmm. Um, but in the top part, before you cross the threshold, is is ordinary world. Once you cross the threshold, on the bottom, all this stuff, second act stuff, is all uh, special world. You know where everything's yeah. different. Um, and then, you know, it could be all the Matrix stuff when you're inside the Matrix. And then um, when you come back from that world, everything you've learned, yeah. uh, having saved the day. You um, see the same thing with new eyes. Right. Yeah. Um, and that's all, by the way, in Matrix, the death and rebirth, he literally dies and comes back. Yeah. Um, and uh, even before, uh, he and now you're talking about the part where uh, there's a false ending, um, the part where he become he believes in himself and he fights the agent and uh, escapes and all, you know, and, he and flies then, away. Right. Yeah. There's the death and rebirth, and then, you know, so you have you don't always have to have a false ending. By the way, any of these points you can uh, tweak, leave out. You tweak can tweak or rework. You or... don't have to have every point all the time, but there yeah. are certain ones you always got to have. Yeah. Like ordinary world and crossing the threshold. It's weird because the the mentor thing is such a it's, it's su- such a sweet spot because yeah. Matrix, Star Wars. We were talking about the Karate Kid earlier. Yeah, we were sort of talking about the Karate Kid earlier with Pervy Miyagi. But uh, yeah, is the mentor and the Karate Kid. I haven't looked at it. I haven't watched Karate Kid in a while. But that that movie definitely hits all the hero's journey beats as well. Um, because he's got all of that stuff. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, the ordinary world in Karate Kid is where he's getting beat up, getting the shit kicked out of him. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. he really doesn't have any focus. Yeah. So he meets the mentor Miyagi, yeah. and, and yeah. they make some trees together. Right. Bonsai. And cr- no. crossing the threshold for him was deciding to just go along with whatever Miyagi says. Yeah. And, be humble, wax on, whatever. It's a waste mm-hmm. of time. It's weird because the call to adventure there is when he asks him if he'll uh, help maintain his cars. Yeah. It's not really It's not really what we would think of as an adventure, like in terms of Star Wars or Indiana Jones or anything like that. Yeah. But that is the subtle like call to adventure mm-hmm. right there. Um, Come I'll, along with me on the ride. I, by the way, the return uh, in uh, Dan Harmon's uh, story circle in the uh, mythic structure. This would be the return with the elixir in the mythic stories and all of that. This is you've gotten the thing. You have the search, find, and take. So he's gotten it, but then you return with the elixir, mm-hmm. um, and you're returning to the ordinary world. That's why I was saying this special world uh, is all second act. So in the third act, this is you're back to your. Uh, Normal, ordinary world, but you're changed. So Star Wars is, uh, he's got the, uh, that's well, when they return with he, Princess Leia. He's got the Force, what is this? In Star Wars, Luke returns to the rebel base as yeah. a hero and receives a reward and recognition. That's also another step in um, the mythic structure mm-hmm. is the, the reward. Okay. So point number eight. Yep. Which we call change. Change. Ultimate resolution. What happens after this character has gone through these circumstances and made these decisions? I was basically skipping ahead just now. Yeah, so basically it is when they get their award at the end. Yeah. And everybody's happy. He's now part of the Rebel Alliance and all that stuff. With Batman, it would be the change is put to the test. Batman defeats the Joker, but the matter of Two-Face remains. So that's you have the false ending with beating the Joker, and then you have the second ending with uh, Two-Face. To preserve Harvey's legacy, he takes the blame for Two-Face's killing spree and commits to protecting Gotham while being hunted and reviled. 
Yes. In doing so, he changes into the Dark Knight. And then the I movie am ends. what Gotham is. So means. it's so cool how that movie actually doesn't really end on a satisfying note. Yeah. He, somehow Batman's like the bad guy, like the not just a vigilante, but a actually hunted villain. Yeah. That people hate. But he realized that he could use the fear yeah. to, um, because Batman doesn't kill. So he could, the more he can intimidate his enemies, the more if they think that he will kill people using Two Faces, uh, you know, killing spree, mm-hmm. uh, taking credit for it, um, they think he'll kill them. So they will act accordingly. That's just the sacrifice we heroes make on our journey. Sometimes yes, we we, we heroes. heroes, yeah, because I'm Batman bitch <laughs> and that by the way that <laughs> brings me to the a special little note that um if you read i highly recommend you read uh joseph campbell's uh, hero's journey i think it's the hero's journey or i don't know if it's uh or the but it, hero's journey joseph campbell um ultimately he will tell you by the time you get to the end he says be the hero of your own story you can apply this stuff to your life, actually. Yeah. Um, and think of yourself as the main character of your story, you know? So that leads us into our next part, the, the whole thing, which is we decided, well, we were looking into this and we were talking about it, and it hit us. Well, how does the hero's journey in our storytelling fit into our own quest to be filmmakers? And, um, and we wanted to give you guys an example of, okay, how do you apply this if we're going to make yeah. the story up? You can find these beats. I know everybody's got their own hero complex about themselves. Mm -hmm. And if you're a director, you might actually have a God complex. I don't, but you know. (laughs) Um, So, but, uh, so what you, what we did is we looked at the hero's journey bullet points, the beats, and said, well, how does us making a movie fall into that? Yeah, at what points in our movie adventure uh, did did we hit these beats? So we're going to scroll back up to beat number one here, and we're going to break it down for you. Break it, break it, break it, yeah. All right, so beat number one, which is you, which we call more more commonly called... I like the ordinary world. Ordinary world. Our ordinary world was we are mundanely going through life wanting to make a feature film, but not ever getting it done. We struggled with it, the timing of things, financing, fellow filmmakers, actors and crew. We, like, for our, for this one film, we worked on it for three years. It, it, we put it together and it fell apart at least two or three other times with completely right. different casts and almost a completely different crew. Yeah. So like two or three different times. Our ordinary world was we making short films, we had our podcast film every we're talking about yes. making movies and we and we even talk about other movies uh critically uh within the with opinions like this wasn't done well the acting was yeah. not good whatever yeah. um and so but every time we would say that or be critical we would think who are we we haven't made a movie <laughs> why should anyone listen to us so always right. in the back of our minds it's you, you, why should we listen to you? It's you haven't made a movie. Really easy to condemn when you haven't done it yourself. Yeah, yeah. So, so it always bothered me because, dude, twenty years ago we made a movie. We not got like ninety percent of a feature film done, yeah. and it completely collapsed at some point. And there, there were missing elements to the production that um, we needed, so the film just was cohesive in a way and we just never got it done so it's a whole feature film we spent like a year of our lives on weekends and nights piecing together one scene at a time it was like our whale our white whale i guess Uh, yeah yeah making a movie was our white whale yeah we caught that bitch (laughs) and here's how (laughs) so um our your ordinary world like what's your ordinary world is your ordinary world uh Maybe you don't even know you want to make movies. Maybe for some reason you're just listening to a filmmaking podcast and it's like your subconscious saying, hey, you know, maybe that's yeah. you, you know. It's like, you know, present you and future you. Yeah. What? Where do you see the future you? And, you know, you're yeah. beginning on your path right now. And in some ways, I said we caught the white whale, but I really feel like we didn't ca- catch the white whale. We caught a we small... We caught its baby. We, we <laughs> caught the baby whale. Yeah, because we really... You know, really, it is. If you feel like you've conquered and you made the best thing you're ever going to make, quit. Because 
if you if you think you're never going to get it as good as that, why are you still doing it? You know what I mean? But there's always something. There's always something to if you learn or get do better. I feel like if you're a true artist, you are constantly unsatisfied with the things you're doing. You know, you know, unhappily working towards the next thing. So I okay, I got that. Now I find now I just need to like do it again and get this part right. Now I got I got these first two things. Now I got to get this third thing right. All right, so anyway. ordinary world. So we we discovered our need. Our need was we have to make a freaking movie, but and we don't have money, um, and we can't ever do it. And by the yeah. way, that is uh, a refusal of a call yeah. that we had. Yeah. That is in the uh, Joseph uh, Campbell's mythic structure. Uh, before you, when you get the call to adventure. Uh, you, there's a refusal of the call yeah. at first, and yeah. for us, it was money, people, yep. um, Nay, naysaying, and actors. They, they were just things that would pop up that we let talk us out of doing it. Yeah. And as they say, in "Oh brother, where art thou?" Fear not the obstacles that are in your the path. Obstacles. <laughs> Fear not the obstacles that are in your path. <laughs> um, but so at this point in our movie. Telling so I I started off where I was in Texas. Yeah, I was still living the good life. Brad didn't even live in Florida right yeah. at this point. I was enjoying myself. Um, <laughs> so we basically basically decided that we were going to make a film, or yeah. that, that we would create one from scratch. Yep. With the idea of um, being able to make it with the resources we had, which yeah. is no money, um, find some people that would help us and do it with us for free. Yeah. And uh, get locations. Just yeah. make it happen. Yep, I remember the phone call. You were, I think, you were even driving from Texas to here. Yeah, I we were on the phone. I said, "Dude, yeah. dude, when you get here, you I, you're I remember gonna, we're going to start a podcast and we're going to write a movie and we're going to make it." You, yeah, and you said, "Is it crazy? Do you think it's crazy to try and make a feature film in twenty four hours?" And I immediately said, "No, we could do it. Yeah. We sh- we write it like it's a play. Uh, have the actors act it out like it's a play, and we just shoot it like yeah. a play." A small insertion here. Yes, it is crazy to try to make a feature yeah. film in twenty four hours, we didn't do and it. we didn't get it done. So, but I actually decided to um, to not put ourselves through that. Making a movie on our own with no budget and stuff like that on a zero budget was already going to be hard enough. Trying to force it into a 24 hour period created a lot of other things that were going to make it harder to make it good than like if I'd made 10 movies and I decided I want to make one in 24 hours that at that point it's an experiment I want to see what we can come up with in that 24 hours but for us to make a film the best we could do we needed to take as much time as we could with it but let me tell you writing having in our heads that we were going to shoot it sort of live action um, in the 24-hour period uh, restricted the script uh, so that we had to have it um, happen within a 24-hour period. Even though that idea went away, the, the... the concept yeah. of 24 hours stuck with us. We knew we knew we couldn't actually do it in 24 hours, but we kept in that in the back of our minds when we we're writing the script mm-hmm. because we needed the story to be um, e- easy enough to shoot. We needed it to we minimum locations. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's why uh, 24 hours worked for us because it's like maybe most of the stuff would happen inside of one apartment at a house or an apartment or right. at a party of some sort with a couple of things outside which most of that would be inside a car and then with maybe two outside scenes um so that that we simplified the story so that we could shoot it on weekends mm-hmm. or with people's available time yeah. yeah so beat number three go we cross the threshold yeah, we, we basically uh, talked with some people like uh, Marco yep. DeGeorge. Uh, of Truthful he, Acting, he yeah. ended up being our, basically... He was our mentor. Like a way. silent producer in a way. He was a silent yeah. partner. He gave us keys to his acting school so we could go in there and do rehearsals Help and helped us, us with actors. auditions and all that stuff. And we actually came to this threshold, like we said before, two other times with original actors that he helped us cast with and an original crew that we had already put together. And it just scheduling and circumstances just kept getting in our way. And we actually, I, in psychologically, I feel like we had like, uh, 
uh, fear of pulling the trigger. It was just like, yeah. we wanted it to be all set up so that when we went, it was going to be perfect. And of course, you we know, and you know, it's yes. never going to be perfect. It's that two, the timing is never going to be just yeah. right. Two years, yeah. we were trying to make it perfect. Yeah. And eventually we realized, you know what? If we're going to make this happen, we have to just set a date yeah. and tell everyone. And whatever, if the sky is falling, we're still going to make those dates. We're, if we have to shoot it outside, yeah. we're playing the roles, whatever. Yeah. We're going to make it happen. Of course, no one would believe that we're brothers. Right. So I'm glad we didn't have to do that. But yes, we, in fact, what gave it, and we didn't even, here's the, here's the sad thing that looking back at it with hindsight, we didn't even give ourselves that deadline. The actor that we cast is like, I'm moving out of the state on this date right here, and that's the last date I can help help you. So that is what gave us the, you got to do this now or, you know, not never, but now or figure out what it is. And that's the deadline that got created that made us say, whatever we have to do to get it done, we got to jump. Yeah. No parachute, by the way. No parachute. We'll make it on the way down. (laughs) Yeah. Which is literally what happened. I mean, we didn't literally jump without a parachute, but... Figuratively, but literally making this movie was felt like we're making the parachute on the way yeah, down because yeah. we did. Um, that brings us to number four, I think. Yes. Like um, which is our search. Uh, we had many roadblocks along the way. We Number one, we had a lack of money. And I have here in my notes one and a half men. <laughs> oh, which I'm is, the half man. You're the half man. <laughs> um, and. Um, we had we had a DP slash producing partner that we enjoyed the idea of working with. Um, he had like since it was no pay or anything, he had sort of life get in the way. Literally a week before production, we'd already had ten pre-production meetings and visualization meetings, talking about how we're going to shoot the thing, how we're going to work it out, and scheduling and all this stuff. And then literally six days before we started shooting, he had to he like had to bail on us. He felt bad about it. I think he still feels bad about he it. He is our producer uh, and DP. And he was he was actually somebody who, the, like a third party that came into our group here and was going to work out a lot of stuff for us. Like he had co- crew and friends that would donate their time to him, not mm-hmm. necessarily to us, but to him. And uh, when he left, all those other things left as well. Yeah. So there we were, <laughs> like literally less than a week before production. And I, I called the one person I knew who I could count on. And it was a former student of mine who had graduated a couple years before, and we'd made one other thing with him. Um, and I'm like, Miles, you just got promoted to DP, and he said, okay. And he's excellent with he's, the camera. He's excellent with the camera. He's good with. And the thing is, he. It was great to see him actually learn as we went, mm-hmm. and actually have somebody who you who I like. I had basically, I didn't know I was grooming him, but like through high school when I was teaching him and into our last film, we, we just sort of like have a working, Yeah, we, we all groove, we groove and really well together. You, the, other, the, thing, the main thing that I think we liked and saw with uh, Miles was that he had, um, what do you call it? He had a mind for, uh, ac- not accuracy, but uh, he had a good eye, first of yeah. all. Um, but he wouldn't. He wouldn't settle for. Yeah. Oh, this shot's okay. Yeah, and he yeah. is a he is a photographer and a cinematographer. Right. He'd just never done a feature film. And by the way, neither had we. I mean, we'd 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 forced gumped our way through one and didn't <laughs> and didn't get it finished. So that's a movieism. Yeah, we forced <laughs> right. gumped our way through. This so movie. I mean, we we had <laughs> fumbled around and, and gotten it. So I mean, I've I, we couldn't. We were at, first of all, we were at the point where we couldn't be picky and choosy, but we ended up with if you just think about it and and go with what you've got, like basically saying yes to the universe. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, he ended up being like like he's the partner who I will anticipate working with all, yeah. you know, in the so next foreseeable future. We were forever. actually okay with uh, with that change because yeah. we both liked Miles' commitment to excellence. We yeah. knew that he would try and get the best shot. Yeah. But um, we also had a makeup artist. Makeup that, artist totally bailed on us, like said, I'll be there, and then yeah. never showed up. And then after the first day when she didn't mm-hmm. show up, we had our own thing worked out. Uh, again, we're not bashing anybody. Like, we know we weren't paying anyone. So, But she said she could be there, and then when she just never showed up, 
Uh, we worked out our own solution, and, and just we just kept going with it. Basically asked the actors to yeah. bring their own makeup. Yeah. And, and we were comfortable with that, and the actors were comfortable with that. In fact, actors end up doing their hair and makeup yeah. by themselves a lot of the time on indie yeah. films. We just, in my mind, I was like, I want to have a makeup and hair person for them yeah. because I wanted to feel more like a legit what, production. What, what sucked about that, though, was that the apartment, first day, the air conditioning quit working. Yeah. So our main actor was sweating a lot. So I, yeah. I wish we had a makeup person just for controlling the Yeah, sweat. or at least a thirsty bath towel. <laughs> <laughs> but that location, that's the other thing. Our location, we had mapped out. We'd, we'd shot listed the whole film based on this particular location. The day before we were set to start shooting, the person who said we could use the location totally bailed on us yeah. and pulled the plug on that location so so in most 24 of our pre-production was went out done, the window out the window shot list all Le- that. less than 24 hours before we were supposed to start shooting so um but i will say so we basically had to like reimagine how we were going to shoot the thing by tomorrow morning by 7 a.m tomorrow morning and um so i was thinking about it at the time and I've been thinking about it a lot since then. We were so, as a director, I was, you know, very aware of every beat in the script and all that stuff. You know, all that stuff the director has to has to be thinking about. We'd worked the scene with the actors as much as we could. So reimagining how to shoot it in another place wasn't that hard because I'd already figured out exactly what we needed yeah. for the scene to work. And it was just filling in the blanks we, of the new location. We just location. needed a couch, a bed, yeah. and a car. Yeah, the whole layout to the... In fact, the the apartment couldn't have been more differently laid out than what we originally imagined. So yeah. we really had to figure out a lot of things, like, on the on the fly, especially on that first day yeah. while we were supposed to be shooting our film, we had to figure out a bunch of things. Yeah. In, in between takes, I had to figure out how we were going to do the next do thing. Do the next and thing. Where, where it was. But since we'd met over and over and again, and you and I had talked about this film... To no end for yes. two years. Since we knew exactly what we needed, it wasn't that easy to shift and change things just a little bit so we could shoot the same thing but you in mean, a new it place. It wasn't that hard? It wasn't that hard. What did okay. I say? You said it wasn't that easy. No, it wasn't that hard. It was not that hard because we were already we already had a plan. We had it in our heads. We had it visualized yeah. already, so we just yeah. had to You have got looked. to show up knowing what to do yeah. what you knowing what you need if you can show up knowing what you need that means any little problem because things are going to go wrong all the time even if it's a perfect production a perfect production still means a hundred things went wrong that mm-hmm. day so those hundred things that go wrong if you have a plan and know exactly what you need and want out of like each little beat will not be that hard to deal yeah. with because you don't have to figure that stuff out and the other things that are also happening to you so before we move on to the next thing i just want to clarify that in the Mythic structure, this is the beginning of your tests, the allies and your enemies. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, sometimes, in some cases, our allies became enemies. <laughs> but so yeah, I'm still mad at you. So that was the fine part of Dan Harmon's yeah. story circle, and we're now to the take part. Which is, how's that? where does that tie into the hero's journey at the take again? Remind me. Um, I'm guessing Belly of the Whale... Oh, at least to the main tension. Okay, the main tension, the yes or no. Okay, so yeah. that's that's where we decided we were going to shoot the thing. We had to shoot it in nine days or we were not going to get it shot. We couldn't say we need a tenth day because people were gone. By they were the gone. Way, Two of our actors moved after we, we, after we, we shot. We did have to create a tenth day sort of squeeze a day in when we weren't supposed to shoot. Right. We, because, we did. Because, because we, had we had a whole day. Because of what's happening in the next beat here. Yeah. So we just decided the yes or no is like, look, we only have nine days to do this. We have got to do it. We cannot sit there and say, well, we can't him and haw over it. You know what I mean? Um, so this is a so lot of things. You're happen. right. We had a lot of things go wrong in those nine days. Because number one, we had no money. We were putting this. We were building the parachute on our way down. Even yeah. though we'd obsessed over the thing for, for two years. There were still things that, because of the nature of our production, uh, being no money, and we were actually like stealing shots from location. We didn't have permits to be out on out on out in yeah. any of the you know city locations or anything like that. We were basically just running and gunning with a lot of this stuff. Guerrilla filmmaking, guerrilla style. We had a driving. So in one day, <laughs> in one day of this production, we not, had... not day one, but in one day, we had to shoot new footage. 
reshoot footage that didn't scene. work from the day before yeah. and shoot pickups from from scenes we didn't get shot the, the next the day before right. all when all we were supposed to be doing was shooting new footage but stuff kind of started folding in on itself we, and we, we had an, we had an entire day of outside shooting with the car if, yeah if driving were, scenes driving yeah. in in the car and then they were at a park outside eating a burrito yeah that everything from that day wasn't usable i mean there were some shots yeah but so we had to figure out how to squeeze in yeah uh an extra day reshooting all that stuff yeah. we shot for um two hours three hours we yeah. shot footage and we did we were this one scene and when you get a chance to see the movie it's the scene that it's all in one take it's like a nine minute scene where they're talking and driving at the same time and we had the camera on the hood of the car shooting through the windshield and the shot just didn't work it just didn't yeah. work and uh and then when they were at the park and we knew while we were shooting that it wasn't really working but we're like oh, got to yeah. but then when we saw it we just realized it was totally unusable so we had to reshoot that the next day yeah we had to take uh when the we time when we had time off mm -hmm. when we weren't scheduled to shoot mm -hmm. and the actor was our actor was scheduled to be doing something out. We had to ask him, could you please yeah. cancel your thing and help yeah. us Yeah. So we thing? shot we shot over nine days, but we didn't shoot nine consecutive days. We had a few days off here and there in between the nine days. Yeah. So we really had about two weeks of days to work with, but we were we really only um we we were only scheduled for nine days and we wanted to at least yeah. respect that from people's times and stuff. And we figured we knew that if we kept saying, well, we've got nine days, but really if we can do a 10 or 11 days here and there that we would tend, we would nickel and dime ourselves all the way right. to the end. And we would possibly not even get it shot. And, and with all that, that wasn't even the most difficult scene. The most difficult scene was the party scene we had. Yeah. And with all that going on up until I've, I might be remembering incorrectly, but up until an hour before we were going to shoot, yeah. I think even up until the time we were supposed to start shooting yep. the scene, we didn't know, we didn't have uh, actors for the scene. Yeah, so scene. we were planning a party scene, and it's an 18-page, basically dramatic... 18 pages? It's an 18-page... In one day! <laughs> it's an 18-page <laughs> section of our script, which is basically leading to the uh, dramatic... Uh, conflict climax, yeah. climax of our of our of our movie basically that builds things and throws things like really messes everything up for all the characters right. um so yes we knew it was crazy to try to shoot 18 pages in a day we knew we weren't going to get it all done but we needed to get as much done of it much of it done as we could so that we had as little to shoot the next day as yeah. possible anyway we had we needed 15 or 20 extras to make it look like a birthday yeah. party and honestly and we called everyone we knew and no one. N we we weren't you know when you're asking people to donate their time on a friday night or was it a saturday night i can't remember it was a I friday it night was friday. all i know it was the longest day of my effing life we got there at like two in the two in the afternoon and did not leave until seven or seven thirty the next morning. morning so it was a long day and we were on our feet working deliriously yeah. the entire time but um, up until we were supposed to shoot. Um, no, we didn't have anybody. Actors. But Marco DeJores, who was yeah. our mentor Casting in this director. journey. Yeah. Uh, dude, he just, oh my God. He got his actors, his acting class, and had them. He just sent them out when his class yeah. ended. Send he them said, to you. guys, go help my yeah. friends. Those guys were great. They sat there for dude, basically till 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning. It was a miracle, man. And looked happy the whole time. They just showed up. Even though the pizza ran out. Long before that, you know, I think there's a part in the uh, in the story structure that where this is basically outside help in the yeah. Joseph Campbell's mythic structure. We got outside help, like the miraculous thing yeah. that uh, if we didn't have that, we wouldn't have this scene. So while we did not get all 18 pages shot because we had a plan, because we had it figured out, and because we were just like trusting the trusting the forward momentum that we had built, yeah. um, we got. I, we got about 14 pages shot that day. Mm -hmm. 14 pages, man. I've never shot so much so quickly. And I've got to tell you, 75% of the time I'm sitting there thinking, 
hoping we're getting everything that we're needing because we're literally, okay, guys, uh, you're going to say that part where you say this, and they said it. Okay, action. Said it. Okay, say it again. You move the camera just a little bit. Say it just a little, just say it a little bit differently. Blah, blah, blah. Do your little quick directing. We're ba- yeah. basically working like that. And then you basically flip the camera around, say, okay, now you say your line. And we were just like going so quickly, but I had a shot list that had about 75 different shots yeah. on it. And I was just drawing a line through every time we... Got stuff. At a yep. certain point, we knew we needed to shoot all of the extra stuff. It's a like a 18-page section, and the extras are there throughout the whole thing. So we were jumping around, shooting all the extra stuff so we could wrap them out. Because we knew we were going to probably yeah. never get that same group of people we, together we again. We needed to get the extras out first. So... Um, but that's shooting way out of context and out of way out of order. Way out of order. We had to order. shoot scenes that were happening yeah. while people were still there, but you couldn't I mean, see it because of the angle. I'm used to shooting <laughs> things out of order. I mean, that, that's just how movies get made. But yeah. this was the most. <laughs> oh my god! It, there was no frame of reference to any of the thing. Okay, yeah. this is the shot where the Dude, extra has to put their drink down and look. At, like, what are they looking at? at Something that ha- we haven't at, shot yet. At you know? some point, <laughs> because we had to redo the shot list and then we had to do things on the fly as well at some point um there was a a period of time where we just weren't using uh what do you call it the slate it was just like yes or or we just writing whatever Mm. on there because it would just we lost it we're like we don't know (laughs) which one what part is just this is take uh seven yeah uh, 17 a 17 d and then it was like 17 d Two and yeah. D three is like what? By the way, this whole thing is being done with a four man crew. Right. I, for, we forgot to mention that. There's me directing. There's you producing, ading basically, running yeah. around solving problems. A sound guy. Our miracle sound guy. A sound uh, guy. Mike who, Battaglia who saved our asses. And uh, a um. Do you say DP and yeah. Miles? Yeah. Miles, our production assistant that had worked with us a lot was actually acting in the scene. So he wasn't really PAing much that all that night. So mm-hmm. we literally did this with like a five person crew. Um, and it was the most insane thing we've ever shot before. And when we got into post-production, I am still shocked when we watched Ugh. this scene to find that we, we might've only had one take of one shot that helped us stitch all those shots together, but we did have that. And it's yeah. because we had a plan and we stuck to it and we did not panic in the moment. Yeah. I don't know. I wasn't I, panicked. By the way, I was very my awareness, my alert. I was very alert. I was to, just you know to transition us to the next thing. Um, the, the, there's two qualities that everyone had, the mm. regardless of flaws and mistakes and not and you know whatever we which one of us did, uh, whatever we were doing wrong, and we, we don't want to take one person to say you did this. But okay, we all weren't perfect, um, but despite all that, what got us through. To, to get everything we needed was patience and perseverance. Those yeah. are the two things that everyone agreed on and that, that made it happen regardless. of there was a point where you were so frustrated that you had to go take a 30-minute yeah, break. Take a breather. And go, right. And then there was a point where a couple of the actors were just fed up and frustrated. But you know what? Did what we needed to do. Uh, we had patience, waited till the people came, and we said, well, sh- now we're... We'll shoot yeah. it now. Um, regardless of how pissed off we were yeah. at any given time, yeah. patience and perseverance. We're yeah. doing this no matter what. Yeah, because honestly, all the little things, the little things that get in your way, the little hiccups, the roadblocks, the obstacles, yeah. all that stuff, that's the universe testing your willpower. Yeah. The universe is saying, how much do you really want this? Um, so are you going to let a little pissing contest or an ego battle or somebody didn't remember their lines the way you know or the you're gonna let that stop you from the ultimate big picture goal of finishing your movie i mean ultimately artistically you want to fight it out so no i believe in i believe in this exact version of this like you are fucking it up (laughs) (laughs) but um ultimately and i mean i was i was probably more guilty of this than anyone as the director um just emotionally like flying off the handle at least twice in our production. I remember yeah. not at you and not really at anything, but circumstantial things. It was just like, I just, I literally, but you have, you, you walk out and you think I'm letting this thing stop me from number one, enjoying making this movie, which is something I've been working on for <laughs> three years at this point, but also a 20 year court path to making the thing. And I'm letting these little things, I'm looking back now. I'm thinking, let the little things piss me off. Cause now we have a movie that I'm pretty proud of. 
I'm very proud of for considering how we made it, mm-hmm. but I'm pretty proud of it by itself. Um, and those little things don't really matter. Yeah. You know, um, what matters is, did you do it? You know, next, uh, the okay. return is when we finally got all our footage done in nine days, right? Yeah. We returned with our elixir. We have this footage. Right. So this would be <laughs> the part. So this is like the false ending. Yeah. It's like, oh, we made the film. Oh, well, yeah, yeah. It's guess <laughs> right. what? It's like, we, now we have to edit the fucking yeah. thing. Yeah. <laughs> You've got audio over here. Yeah. And then you got all this video over here, some of which the, uh, te- what do you call it? The slate was yeah. either not there or wrong or you couldn't see it because it was out of focus. Whatever. <laughs> so... Yeah, that was a big monster itself. Yeah. So, yeah, you do have this, like, gratification or satisfaction yeah. of, we, we got it shot, man. High five, everybody. Hey, what's this? Oh, wait a second. Yeah. It's going to be another year in post-production? False resolution. <laughs> <laughs> so, we had to merge audio. We had, like, a one oh. little brief little heart attack of some missing footage that didn't get transferred off of an SD card that, luckily, for some weird reason, didn't get wiped the card didn't get wiped and we yeah. didn't reshoot on that card again because we were missing footage from like the fifth or sixth day. We weren't missing footage from the last day. We were missing footage from the fifth or sixth day that should have been wiped out and reused as an SD card yeah. for the, for the camera we were shooting on. However, it wasn't. Yeah. And we like, we honestly, we've, I still kick myself over it because it's a rookie mistake that I constantly tell all my students and I constantly tell myself, I'm very meticulous in the way we, you, and you too, we're very yeah. meticulous. We organize backups of backups. <laughs> we, we, you and I organize differently, but we're both meticulously organized in our own way. Yeah. The fact that we lost footage or didn't even know we had lost footage until we got into post-production, uh, just, it terrifies me. I stopped. I'm going to give myself Ugh. nightmares now thinking about it. Yeah. Um, um, so yeah, you just, and the problem is we had four people. Like, the shooter was shooting, the director was directing, you were working on sound and problem solving, and the PA, what does he know? You know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it's like, uh, so, like, it Which is makes, part of the reason why the slate was off, because it wasn't an expert slate person. And it makes sense that we, it makes sense when you zoom out from it that we lost footage. Yeah. But it still is terrifying. But we found the footage. We found it. We got it, cut it together. The movie was able to finish because of that if we have lost if we had lost that footage we'd be totally screwed because i don't know how we would have made certain things work without that specific footage it would have been a different movie would have been different yeah because we're missing like dramatic climax footage footage, yeah. yeah um so change that leads us to like the third act resolution yeah part of our filmmaking story premiere we had a finished film finally yeah finally had a finished film that was also a false resolution because when we thought we were finished, once we saw it in front of an audience, we knew there were other yeah. things we needed to fix. Yep. Um, so we had, we had a finished film that played well in front of our friends and family and crew and everybody who was who made the movie um, got to see it and realized that their efforts were not in vain. And uh, you know, but the real thing was we didn't really get to sit with that finished film feeling for what for long because we had to promote the film we had to try mm-hmm. to get it out to uh got to sell tickets to the premiere we rented a theater space that we had to pay for and all that stuff so it was just stress all the way i really didn't relax about the movie until we till after that premiere um and then yeah. then again from watching it we realized there were tiny little things we needed to tweak again because we'd mm-hmm. seen it now blown up onto a big huge screen with a group yeah. of people and and ultimately we're gonna at some point we're gonna, it's gonna be on amazon and you know on demand for people for yeah. everyone to see so we wanted it to wanted to refine it and make it perfect right so we're well, not perfect but as good as it could be with what we have some of the reviews we got from our movie when we premiered it, our uh, yeah. best phone sex scene ever. Which uh, scene number one? Good even, job, Brad. Even though it's the most embarrassing scene <laughs> I've ever written, uh, that is, I, I take yeah. it as a compliment. Yeah, she said funniest phone sex scene yeah. ever, and that's what I was going for. Awkward, yeah. Funny, funny. Yeah, yeah. And Brad missed his calling because Brad's got a small little cameo in that where that brings the yeah. house down every I, time. I pop up. Uh, three times for just a few seconds, yeah. but the timing and the way we yeah. wrote it and edited yeah. it, uh, it really makes an impact really on the scene. Impact. And people like it. You yeah. know, we hoped they would. We hoped that it wouldn't bring the movie to a screeching halt. And... It, it was supposed to be a uh, comic relief of the tension. Yeah. Uh, this tension, people yelling, whatever. So it was supposed to yeah. 
help you, uh, give you a breath while all this yeah. chaos is going on. Um, and my dad, who is a preacher, said, <laughs> everyone in this movie needs to get to church. I'll see you guys on Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. so, yeah, a movie that starts with a, I don't know, a five-minute phone sex scene doesn't get more tame as it goes. Yeah. yeah. So, so we tried to weed out. There's a lot. You know, when you show mo- your movie to your friends and family, you're, most of the comments you're going to get are... Uh, you know they're gonna try and tell you what they think you want to hear. Yeah. So, but we, out of all the uh, comments, we tried to filter out the ones that we thought were uh, not telling us what we want to hear, yeah. but yeah, yeah. 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 truth and yeah. honest. Yeah. So uh, that's it, man. That is our that is our concept of the hero's journey and how it ties into our journey yeah. as a filmmaker. So we would ask you what. Where are you at in your filmmaker's journey? Are you just now starting to realize that you want to step out of the ordinary world? You're going to cross that threshold. Or maybe you're in the middle and you want to figure out, like, what do you, what, how do I write this thing? We're going to get to all that stuff. Yeah, we're going to yeah. have specific episodes where we will break down uh, our methods uh, of you know, characters and storytelling, yeah. the three-act structure. This is a story structure. Yeah. Uh, overall, but so we're gonna uh, go, tell, go into specifics about three act structure, our characters, how we figure out uh, how they're gonna act and and how they react to what yeah. happens. And we realized that, like again, our way is not the way because there are dozens, if not hundreds, of how to write a screenplay book out yeah. there, books out there. But we have what we were thinking when we were writing our script, and, and it a, helped us get our movie made. And also in the way that we gave you a simplified version of the story the mythic structure or story structure we're also going to give you a simplified version of creating characters and uh, recognizing them yeah different kinds of plots and stuff like that right yeah. so it, we're just trying to simplify everything and give you uh, our formula so that if you're missing anything from your story or you're stuck and you don't know how to we're going to give you simple little matrices that you can just apply to uh, so that you can make your you can write your own movie, uh, whether you're producer, director, whatever. If you d- you can apply this to a short film. If you need to make a short film, you want to make your own thing. You can use any one of these techniques that we're going to uh, tell you about, and uh, it will help you with your writing. Yeah. So if you have questions or feedback, if uh, you need you want you would like some clarification, you just want to pick yes. our brain a little bit. Send us an email at filmreveriepodcast at gmail dot com yeah. and. Again, to, if you listen to this whole thing without downloading our little story circle thing that we broke down on, you know, Dan Harmon's story circle, but also how our own filmmaker journey fit mm-hmm. into that thing. If you listen to that whole thing without downloading our thing, go to our website, filmreverie.com, sign up for our mailing list, mm-hmm. and uh, you'll get a, a link right away, right, to, to yeah. download the thing, to download this thing, and you go, and go through it for yourself. We really think that, honestly... If we can make a movie for nothing, you can make a movie for nothing also. Like, literally, mm-hmm. one and a half men. I'm thinking of changing our production company's <laughs> name to one and a half men. Is, <laughs> we will probably do that eventually. Uh, no, I, I already have two production companies. I don't need another. Well, <laughs> you have LLCs that you make for movies. Uh, so one of the yeah. LLCs will be one and a half men. So uh, that's it for this time. We will be back next week. Uh we're sort of trying to drop in interview uh, sh- episodes in between our uh, filmmaker journey yeah. episodes, but we uh, week to week we're not exactly sure how interviews are going to fall into place. So we may be back with a filmmaker's journey episode. We may be back with a interview next week. Not sure. Either way, please stay tuned, as Brad likes to <laughs> stay say. Stay And we will uh, see you around next time. Yeah. Filmreveriepodcast at gmail.com. Yeah, filmreverie.com to sign up for the mailing list. Yep. And um, more than anything else, go make something. Just do it. The end. No, I have to say it with more. I'm so happy. The end. And cut. <laughs> Film Reverie Podcast is a production of Super Mega Ultra Entertainment and is produced by Michael Beckemeyer and Bradley Kingston. If you're enjoying this podcast, please be sure to leave us a five-star review in iTunes. And visit FilmReverie.com to listen to past episodes, and be sure to click like or subscribe wherever you find us. That's it for this time. We'll see you again next week with another episode of Film Reverie.